It's absolutely lovely to be here today and especially because I know a lot of you are public servants. My father was a public servant and you are making the policies and advising the people that we need to get to when it comes to cyber hate. So just very quickly, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we meet and acknowledge their elders and just say this always was and always will be Indigenous land. So my book, Troll Hunting, came out about six weeks before the Christchurch massacre. And as many of you would know, this is where a gunman walked into a mosque in New Zealand in Christchurch and shot dead 51 people and a lot more people were injured. And so immediately after that happened, I started to get these messages from all over the world, people who had read my book. And what people were saying to me was, Ginger, are you watching this? Are you listening to this? Can you see what's happening? Because this is exactly the stuff that's in your book. All the context is there. And, you know, I actually cried when that happened, when I started reading about the details of that massacre, firstly because of the damage done to that community. And I actually went to New Zealand not long after this happened to try to explain the radicalisation of that guy to the community, but also just like, you know, all these people were dead and there were so many people that loved them. And then I was also crying, I realised, in frustration because... For years, I have been writing about cyber hate and the internet and watching people kind of get killed as a result of predator trolling and saying that the social media platforms have a case to answer because they have created these spaces where we are coming to grave harm. Now, I use this term predator trolling, so I just want to explain to you uh, what I mean by it, and I'll go back and talk about it a bit more in a second. But really, when I talk about predator trolling, what I am talking about is where one or more individual is using the internet and digital devices to do real life harm. And that can be physical, mental, or both. So over the years, my increasing concerns about the way that the internet is being weaponized have really been treated, you know, it's really been treated by hyperbole by most people. And people say things like, you know, stay off the internet, love. <laughs> Has anyone here been told that? Stay off the internet, love. Uh, just block and delete, you know. But to anyone like me that was watching the kind of rapes and murders on these platforms, like, Facebook Live and really similar broadcast products, that massacre that happened in Christchurch was actually devastatingly predictable. And my book is actually full of humans who die because of predator trolling. And I've got to say, you know, <laughs> there wasn't any joy in being right about something like this. I'm going to come back to this massacre uh, and talk about how that guy was radicalised and what we need to do as a community to stop that ever happening again. But first of all, I want to go back a little bit and just talk to you about why I became a cyber hate expert. I'm not a techie person. My husband is always asking me, how come you've had this Mac for five years? You still can't scroll on it. You know, I cannot use my phone. I drop my phone. I was never interested in the internet, really. I was interested in the humans. I never set out to uh, have this area of expertise. But uh, what happened was... Six years ago, uh, an army of predator trolls came after me and my family. Has anyone seen this photo before? Yeah. Okay, I took this photo in Cairns in 2010 and it's now been used all over the world and it still is. Uh, so basically in 2010, I worked for ABC. I worked for ABC for a long time. And I was posted to Far North Queensland in Cairns. And I did this series about the LGBTIQ plus community there because they were getting a terribly hard time. It's quite a conservative community and, you know, they were experiencing all these human rights abuses. So really, I did this series of features just about their lives. This wasn't Today Tonight. It was just stories about what was happening to these folk. And one of these nine features was about these two guys, Mark Newton and Peter Chuang. And this little boy, they told me that they had had by a surrogacy in Russia and that he was Mark's biological child. And I spent quite a lot of time with this family. By 2013, I had gone back to Canberra, where I'm from. I was on maternity leave with my second child. And these two men got arrested and charged as members of an international paedophile ring. And it turned out that that little boy was not a biological child of either of those men. He was actually purchased from the Russian mother 
of him um, for eight thousand US dollars. What happened was a conservative blogger in the United States and journalist, his name is Robert Stacey McCain, he got hold of this story and he decided that he was going to shame me. So he wrote this series of blogs and he incited all his thousands and thousands of followers to shame me. So this is the kind of stuff, I don't know if you can read this over here. This is the kind of stuff I was getting. My Twitter handle used to be Fresh Chili and it was essentially people saying, you know, you're a paedophile enabler, you should pay for what you've done, you are morally culpable for the crimes against this child. And then what happened was it got worse because late at night I got this tweet saying, your life is over. And, you know, I said I wasn't techie. So what I realised was my tweets were geolocated, which means that you could click underneath them and pinpoint our house on Google Maps. At the same time, this is my husband here. You can see he's a person of colour, which becomes relevant later. Um, this is my two and a half year old daughter at the time. And you can see I'm really pregnant there. This photo was taken from Facebook. We took it for our family Christmas card, actually. It was put on a fascist website. And then there was all this foul commentary underneath it. Now, this was particularly scary for me because my family fled the Holocaust. A number of my mum's family were gassed in the Holocaust. So these two things happened at the same time. And I just cannot tell you the terror of this, right? Like lying in bed thinking, did I just put my kids' lives at risk because of my job as a journalist? And nobody could tell me what the level of the threat was, right? I'm going to swear, excuse me, but I rang my boss at the ABC and I talked to him about this and he said, call the employee assistance program. And I was thinking, no, you fuckwit. Like, I need to know, is someone going to kill my kids? I don't need a psychologist, right? And the cops were the same. Guess what they said to me? Stay off the internet, love. So I... Uh, you know, luckily for us, nothing did happen because what I know from writing my book now is that you can get killed because of this stuff. So after a couple of years, probably 18 months, professional curiosity took over. Like I'm a social justice journalist and I just wanted to know, like, who are these guys? Like, why would you send someone that you do not know a death threat? And at the same time, my colleagues in the ABC, actually lots of public servants now, big government departments are coming to me going, oh my God, the cyber hate, what do we do? Um, but at the time, I was watching lots of female journalists in particular getting rape threats, death threats, beheaded women in their inboxes. They were afraid to go home. Um, some of them were starting to take their perpetrators to court to try to stop it and similar stuff in the States, right? So I just wanted to know, you know, why would you do this? Who are these dudes? So when you're being targeted, you feel like it's personal, but actually it's business for them. They're just trying to find your weakest point. So it might be your race, it might be your ethnicity, it might be that you're fat, it might be that you're black, it might be that you're gay. And actually, you know, it might be that you're a victim of a crime, like rape. But for me, that was really useful because I now, you know, when I get this stuff, I know that and it feels much less personal. So if we know what they want, I think it gives us a great power as potential victims. This guy, Mark, I mean, I spent five years with a bunch of guys like this. He uh, told me that he used the internet to find like-minded accomplices. So, you know, we have this idea that trolls are alone, they're working alone. They are not alone. So this trope of the guy alone in his mum's basement is not correct. These guys are working in big international syndicates. It's much like bikey gangs. They have presidents, they have vice presidents, they all know each other. You know, they do raids together and things like that. So um, it, it's important that we understand um, this threat at this extreme end. One of the things that's really confusing about this conversation is this, right? This is the depiction of a troll. And in fact, Lunig did this the other day and I was ranting and raving about it, you know. We associate the word troll with Billy Goat's Gruff that we, you know, used to get read as kids. This is a little guy under a bridge. He's a bit cranky, but he's not really going to harm us in real life. And that is not true. So trolling is a subjective term. And this idea that it is not harmful is really problematic, okay, because 
The word troll really doesn't convey this meaning that we need it to. This is why I've started talking about this extreme kind of trolling as predator trolling and I talk about cyber hate. But I don't actually think all trolling is harmful and I think that trolling should exist in some ways because does anyone know what a Rickroll is? Yeah. Okay. Do you know Rick Astley's song, Never Gonna Give You Up? Do you recognise this? Okay, I think that came out in 1987. Does anyone know? Maybe 1998. Um, so Rick Rowling is a, one of the oldest and funniest, I think, kinds of trolling where you think you're maybe researching something serious and you accidentally click on a link of Rick Astley. And it's hilarious, right? There's a tweet up there from the White House when they did a Rick Roll. Everyone's done it. And Rick Rolling, um, I read an article the other day where Rick Astley actually uh, credits Rick Rolling for uh, reviving his career. And I actually saw him rickroll a parade. I think it was in New York City. He was on a float hiding and he came out and rickrolled the crowd and it was just fabulous, right? So that's funny. That's hilarious. That's on one end of the spectrum, right? So we, what we need to understand is that trolling is a spectrum of behaviours. And at one end, it's funny, hilarious and harmless. There's some really important political ways that you control and social ways you control. It gets more extreme in the middle and we start to see hate speech. And then at the extreme end, we've got predator trolling and you know, that causes hate crimes. This is another really funny uh, thing I wanted to show you just because a lot of you are advising politicians. Does, does anyone know about Stop Tony Meow? So this is hilarious. Basically a bunch of hackers and trolls, they decided they wanted to get Tony Abbott out of office when he was Prime Minister. And they created this browser extension called Stop Tony Meow. And what happened is I even put this on my laptop because I was like, you know, I'm a news junkie. So I was getting these pictures of Tony Abbott all the time. And Stop Tony Meow would replace every picture of Tony Abbott with a kitten. And do you know, I actually trolled myself really badly with this because I forgot it was on my laptop and he got booted out of office, so he wasn't in the news much. And then I was researching this story about a friend of mine who's been a makeup artist at Parliament House in Canberra for 30 years and she has, you know, combed John Howard's eyebrows and whatever. She's been through about 10 prime ministers, but I was trying to work out how many prime ministers she'd been through. And then I was looking at all their photos and then there was a kitten in the middle of them and I was like, what the fuck is that? And then I actually had this still on my laptop. So yeah, so I don't want you to think trolling is all bad, but at the very extreme end, which is where my interest lies, it is linked to terrorism, it is linked to incitement to suicide, it is linked to murder, it is linked to real life story, stalking, domestic violence and lots of other harms, you know. So... Given what happened to me and my family, lots of people ask me this question like, why, Ginger, would you go and talk to these guys? Why would you do that? You know, and when I did first get asked to write the book, I did think, you know, I cannot justify this. My husband was like, he's a person of colour, as you saw, he's got anxiety. He was like, just leave this alone. I don't want you to write about this. This you, you, Enough harm has been done. But I felt like I had to write this book and I will tell you why. Because in the middle of 2017, I did this series for Fairfax about predator trolling that went viral. It was published on all the front of the Fairfax papers here and in New Zealand. And there was a video with Mark. And what happened after that was cyber hate targets just started to write to me, dozens and dozens of them. And they were describing their destroyed lives like... I've lost my job, my reputation's wrecked, I can't get another job, I have PTSD, I've been to court, I've had to move house. Like these harms just went on and on and on, like lots of suicide attempts. And they were so overwhelming, I put them in this folder and I wrote the email saying, I'm so sorry, thank you to publishers uh, who've offered a book deal, I'm not interested, I can't. And then I went back to that folder and I read those emails and I just thought, you know, somebody has to do something. So when I was actually writing the book, I was like, what is the thing, you know, I'm actually quite left wing and I was like, what is the thing that's going to stop people across the political spectrum saying, don't be a snowflake, pull your big girl panties up and actually understand this. And what I thought was if I could get the money, if I could say how much cyber hate costs, then everybody would have to shut up and pay attention. And so I started ringing all these economists going, 
I need this data. I couldn't find any data anywhere in the world about the cost of cyber hate. And that mostly they were just like, shut up and would hang up the phone like, what's Twitter? Who's this bonkers woman? But Richard Dennis from The Australian, who I know, he's the most, actually, he's such a visionary. I don't, I think he's very under-recognised. I called him and he was like, oh my God, this is really important. We're going to help you get the data. And at the time, I think he was a chief economist at TAI. He probably still is. Or he was director for a while. But anyway, so I paid out of my own money, bargain basement prices, and the Australia Institute, thank you, Australia Institute, did nationally representative polling for me about the incidents and cost of cyber hate. So what we found was uh, TAI and myself, 44% of Australian women and 34% of Australian men have experienced online harassment. It's 8.8 .8 million adult Australians. There's only 25 million of us altogether. So that's a lot of us. And at the extreme end, it's 1.3 million who've been predator trolled. So that is a ton of people. The high aggregate cost of cyber hate what we found was it was $3.7 billion and that's only time off work and medical costs, right? It's not court costs, police costs, moving house, getting security, all the other things. So actually I would love to do that polling again and I would probably ask different questions and more questions. Actually that figure is just a drop in the ocean. So um, I want to talk to you about something else. Who here has to be online either for work or their social life? Who has to be on the internet? Yeah. Is there anyone that just isn't on the internet, never has to go online? No. The United Nations has just recognised internet access as a human right, okay? So telling people to get off the internet is actually victim blaming and it's ludicrous. It's like saying don't drive on the roads. Extreme online harassment is an occupational health and safety issue. And increasingly, I've been saying this for five years and finally people are like, ah. Oh. Um, you heard me describe how terrifying that was, okay, when it happened to me and my family. There is a story in my book of a female writer, Van Batum. A lot of you would know her. She was punched on the street as a result of online hatred because she's a writer, basically. She had to take a perpetrator to court. She has PTSD from that, all that process and ongoing mental health issues because she gets this kind of trolling all the time, actually often from people on the left uh, another journalist in my book, Sherelle Moody, she, do you know her? She works for News Corp. She's also an uh, anti-DV campaigner. Her horse was killed as a result of cyber hate. It happened in real time while I was writing the book. She got a threat. She told me she got the threat and then she said, my horse is dead. Uh, and someone gave her dog acid and burned out the inside of her dog's mouth. So this is very real life. It's not virtual. It does not stay online. And so essentially sending staff onto the internet without proper training, this is like sending workers onto work sites with no safety equipment and no training. Everyone who is on the internet for work needs to have social media self-defence training. The football player Taylor Harris said this is a workplace health and safety issue and she is right. You know, and if she, she's young and fabulous, but if she can see it, we all should be able to see it. Basically what you get with social media policies, and I've read some of the uh, federal government and uh, state government social media policies, the policy protects the departments, but it doesn't protect the individual from risk, right? The most I could find is there was a reference to privacy in one of them. It is not good enough. It has to protect you, you know, because there's a lawyer quoted in my book. His name is Roger Blow. He's a commercial litigator and social media expert. And what he said to me was, Ginger, people like you are going to sue places like the ABC or government departments for trauma and you are going to win because basically that workplace hasn't provided a safe workplace and the internet is your workplace, right? So it's a huge issue for everybody. Uh, I'm getting lots of calls from panicked government departments at the moment, but particularly for female politicians and for female journalists. And I know that you're advising a lot of politicians. Uh, this is a huge thing. I spoke in Adelaide at the Commonwealth Women's Parliamentarians a fortnight ago, and those women afterwards, they were crying because the cyber hate against them is so extreme. One of the politicians, I said to her, you need to go to the police. That is a fixated person. That is the same circumstances in which the UK politician Joe Cox was shot. You know, so please take this seriously when you are advising politicians. It happens to men too. Amnesty's done a lot of work on this stuff. Um, 
they, you know, uh, politicians and female journalists are getting abusive tweets every 30 seconds and around the world. And uh, people of colour, it's much, much worse because they do minority stacking. So they stack your minorities against you. Um, it's a democratic threat, basically, and there's lots of research around the world coming out about that. There's a politician in Tasmania, she just resigned a few weeks ago, a local politician, she quit because of trolling, right? So she was elected and she cannot do her job and she now is no longer in that job. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, like when I was writing the book, I formed these really long-standing relationships with these guys uh, over about five years. Mark is one of the earliest guys I... Uh, made contact with. And what they do is they police discourse with themselves at the top of the food chain. So they're kind of white supremacists, a lot of them outright, not all of them. There's dudes on the left and the right and there's women as well, but mainly these guys in this cohort, this extreme, you know, predator trolling cohort. Uh, so what I mean is they're policing anyone they consider to be other. They don't want their position, their perceived position at the top of the food chain threatened. And so it's women, people of colour, people with disabilities, LGBTIQ plus people, people they feel are threatening them, okay? And they stack people's minorities against them. So if you are gay and you are a woman and you are a person of colour, like, good luck, you know, because they're looking for your weakest point. So they perceive that as lots of weaknesses together. And anyone who is in a minority group on the internet and speaks up, you know, they will tell you this. The Christchurch killer was a predator troll and he almost precisely fits the definition. And so right afterwards I was waiting for this piece of information to come out and his grandma said he was always alone on the internet. And I think to most people that just went over their head but to me I was like, yes, he was. And the reason that is so interesting to me is because there's a chapter in the book called The Internet Was My Parent. And what that chapter describes is that these guys from the age of 10 or 11, they are left alone on the internet, completely alone. Most of them are from really damaged families, uh, like economically uh, struggling and, you know, violent households, lots of neglect, that kind of stuff. And what those guys are doing is they are on 4chan, 8chan, Reddit, Tumblr, these cesspits of the internet, and they are imbibing these ideologies like white supremacy, misogyny, racism, and they are radicalised into trolling. And so a few years later, I don't think we can be amazed, but they get spat out as the kind of Christchurch killer guy. So this is a really key message. Who's got kids here or looks after kids even? Yeah. Do not leave your kids alone on their devices. <laughs> Make sure they're looking at them in common areas of the house and know what they are doing online. So these guys are mainly between 18 and 35 and they are just, they, they kind of are angry with the world and they're trying to get back at the world and that's what, you know, they told me. I read the Christchurch Killers Manifesto in its entirety and he really sees himself as being in this marginalised kind of cohort um, and he went on and on about, you know, white genocide and things like that. that this is a common ideology among these guys. Um, and he actually did this really clever thing. That document was brilliant for what it was designed for. Predator trolls do a thing that they call media fuckery and what they're doing is co-opting the media for their own purposes. And he really did do that. He laid lots of bait for the media that the media swallowed wholesale. I think the bottom feeders at the Daily Mail republished it in its entirety. But, and by doing that, they brought all these other people to that ideology. I just came back from Norway and a guy there about a month ago, maybe it's five weeks now, six weeks, he went into a mosque there and tried to copy that killing, the Christchurch killing. Exactly. So, you know... With the media doing that, what we are doing is actually promoting these kinds of violence and promoting copycat crimes and bringing more people to white nationalism. He wasn't a lone wolf either. He was on 8chan. I've read all his posts beforehand. He was saying exactly what he was going to do and he was egged on by his cohort, right? This is the same as so the media was like, he's a lone wolf, he's a lone wolf. He wasn't a lone wolf, no. They were telling him to kill as many as possible and we'll be watching, mate, you know. 
Um, and that's, you know, a lot of these white supremacist guys, Philip Manshouse, the Norwegian guy I was just talking about, you know, um, the El Peso shooter who killed 22 people in Texas, William Atchison, a high school shooter at the front of my book, they are all on these forums, right? They are all on N-chan, 8-chan, 4-chan, these places. And then you know what happens? The police come out and go, we had no idea. He wasn't on a watch list. And I just cannot understand this. Like, why wasn't he on a watch list? If I can find it and I can't use my phone, you guys can find it. I can tell you where to go. They're all on the poll boards, P-O-L. You know, they're talking about this stuff. So this is not an Australian problem. The police around the world are out of their depths when it comes to this stuff and it find it terrifying. Um, I have to say, though, when Catherine Devney was attacked after her Anzac Day Street uh, tweets and um, the United Patriot guys turned up to her house in the middle of the night after she was doxxed, so all of her information was put online, the Victorian police were amazing. The counterterrorism police turned up immediately and contacted her immediately. Um, so you, oftentimes what happens, though, is that all the evidence online and no one is, is online and no one is looking. It is illegal to use a carriage service to menace and harass someone. So actually our legislation is quite good, but often what you get is just a gap between the willingness, you know, an unwillingness of police and courts to enforce that stuff, although increasingly they are, right? So there is a change. I'm just, I'm not going to go on and on, but I do want to say that uh, the real issue, one of the huge players here that is always missing in action are the social media companies. The Australian Safety Commissioner, Julie Inman Grant, she argues for the social media companies to implement, or all the platforms, to implement what she calls safety by design. And what this means is that these platforms, these products are not sent out to market while they are unsafe. Can you imagine putting a car on the road with no seatbelts? No. We cannot wait for people to get killed and then do something. I went to Facebook Live about a year, uh, Facebook, uh, about a year ago and I said to them, Facebook Live is not safe. And they said to me, yes, it is. And then we have Christchurch where it was broadcast. You know, it was all broadcast on Facebook Live. So I don't think we can trust them <laughs> to fix it they're not going to fix it by themselves. They've been bleeding about fixing cyber hate since at least 2006. They are monolithic companies. They have more users than China and India put together, the, the populations like Facebook and Twitter. They pay no tax almost. They make billions of dollars from our data. They have the best engineers in the world working for them. If I put on one kilo, they target me for hate, you know, weight loss. So if they can fix that, they can fix cyber hate. They don't want to fix it. And the reason that they don't want to fix it is because they make money from it, right? What happens in a cyber hate event? Think back to those tweets I was getting. People pile on, right? Ching, 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 money. <laughs> so I think we need to really address this in policy, in legislation, okay? This is all of your jobs when you're advising ministers and you're looking at legislation. They have to do more. This kind of stuff... Oh, no, not Rick Astley. We've had enough of him. Um, you know, this kind of stuff doesn't violate their policies. Like I sat in the Senate hearings watching the cyber hate, you know, there was cyberbullying Senate hearings last year and I sat there watching these guys from these companies not answer a single question from our senators, the people we've elected to run the country. They don't have a duty of care to us. You know, they don't even think they need to answer our questions. They're not going to fix it on their own and we need to do something about that. I have to tell you though, I think it's changing and the reason I think it's changing is because politicians keep plagiarising me and they keep plagiarising my book. Uh, this is the fourth politician. This is from the Prime Minister the other day on the front page of The Australian and this is page 144 of my book. He basically took, lifted the whole thing. <laughs> um, and it's funny now because people, all my friends are watching for it. They're like, oh, dude, Mitch Fifield. Oh, dude, Angus Taylor, Bill Shorten. So they've all taken parts of my work which is outrageous, and if you are writing speeches for politicians, could you please get them to acknowledge it? But anyway, uh, I'm watching you. I know. The eSafety Commission told me that Malcolm Turnbull used to do this to her and she actually said to him at one point, I need to get some new material because I've heard you rip that part of my work about five times. Um, anyway, the point is they're paying attention. Things are changing, all right, and I think, you know, that's good. Um, I would like to see a legislative duty of care to the public. 
And I would also, like Josh Bornstein, the lawyer from Morris Blackburn who's quoted here, I would like to see these companies broken up because they have too much power. Just really quickly, I think you're all probably going, oh, my God. When I, I hear people, when I'm talking, they're like, oh, I thought this was just going to be about people being mean on the internet. Um, people always ask me, what can I do? How? And I really am reticent about this because this is like a domestic violence victim saying, what do I do to stop somebody hurting me? It's not the victim's fault. They are allowed to be on the internet. They are allowed to have a voice. So I think we need to be really clear that the onus mustn't be on the victim to fix this. And I'm always really reticent about giving this advice, but I will tell you just a couple of things that might help you if you're a cyber hate target with that caveat kind of in mind. If you or someone you know is being attacked in this way, uh, you need psychological armour. So listening to this stuff today is really important because you know that it's out there. When it happened to me, I had no idea it was out there. I don't believe in the don't feed the trolls kind of, you know, moniker that we all use. And the reason I don't believe, I used to believe it. Actually, uh, Christina and I had this, we had, we were, talking about this just yesterday I used to think don't feed the trolls was right because remember they're sadists and they want to hurt and upset you so if you don't respond you know they're not you're not giving them what you want but remember also they are trying to silence really critical voices that is what they are aiming to do so if you don't respond you are being silenced I'm not telling you what to do I'm just saying that we don't want critical voices in our society silenced Personally, I don't want only white supremacist men to have a voice. You know, for a pluralistic society, we need to hear these different viewpoints. So I'm all about the bystanders these days. If you see someone getting attacked, it's just like what they tell your kids in the school playground. Bystanders are the key partly to this. Like intervene, send that person a private message of support. If you want to, publicly support them, amplify their voice, make them bigger. You know, I do this all the time and it works. Get other people to help make that person bigger, all right? Do not allow that silencing to happen. If it happens to you, lean on your social network for support, your real-life friends and family. It's really important. I've been getting really badly attacked over the last few days and my real-life friends and family are absolutely crucial, like offline I'm talking about. These buttons, mute, block, they're all really important. They're there for a reason. Turn off your notifications at night. Why do you think you would do that? If you are in the middle of a cyber hate event and everyone's telling you how much they hate you and they're attacking all sorts of things about you and late at night you are reading this stuff, you will not be able to sleep. Tara Moss told me that she, she cops a lot of cyber hate. She leaves her devices outside the bedroom. So really important just to stop it going around in your head because if you read that at 11 o'clock at night, I guarantee you will not be able to sleep. Report anything serious to the platform, to the e-safety commission and to police, okay? Like that MP that came up to me and told me she had a fixated person, she didn't report it to the police. I was like, you have to go to the police. You know, this is really, you know, they're there to help us. And increasingly, they, you know, they're getting better at, much better at dealing with this stuff. Hassle your bosses about social media self-defence training. And if you are advising politicians and public servants about this stuff, please understand how serious it is, you know. And understand as well if, if it's female politicians, they might be copying it and so might their staff. You know, I've just, I can't believe the stuff those female politicians from around the country were telling me and the trauma. Like, they were all crying after I spoke to them in Adelaide. I just, it... It, honestly, I haven't stopped thinking about it. Okay, so do you want me to tell you one happy story? Have we got time? Because everyone gets so depressed by the end. I'll just tell you a couple of, one really happy story and then I'll let, you know, us go to the panel because we've got this amazing uh, panel we're going to have in a second where we're going to tell you lots of stories and you can ask questions. Um, does anyone know what an incel is? Yeah. Okay, so one of the guys I was in contact with for a year he was an incel when I met him, which means an involuntary celibate. So these guys believe that you can use violence to get sex off women. They hate women, but they still kind of want sex off them. So when you read the chat logs, it's just nauseating, right? It's absolutely nauseating. And it's violent, sexually violent. It's misogynistic. So this guy was an incel. 
And then after about a year, this is the only thing the trolls wouldn't let me put in the book. So it's not in the book. If you buy the book, it's not in there. Um, <laughs> he said, uh, thank you so much, Ginger, because I no longer hate women. And it was really just a year of me talking to him. That's it. Because once I got on the apps with them, they're like, ping, 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 ping. You know, they wouldn't shut up. And um, he told me that he'd started dating a woman. And I was a bit like, oh, lucky her. But, um, <laughs> but... I do, so I think this is a story of hope and humanity, right? I didn't actually do anything. I just talked to him for a year. It was just like normal human kindness that changed him into a much kinder person. And he's still in contact with me and he's really kind. He's always interested in how are you and this is what I'm doing and what's happening. So we are actually friends now. <laughs> I know it's weird. People are like, oh, um, how can you engage with the perpetrators like that? So... Uh, I don't think we can solve hatred with hatred. There has to be another way. And I'm all about radical empathy with this stuff. You know, even though lots of feminists have written to me and criticised me about engaging with the perpetrators like this. You know, and I think we need to think about what the goal is here. And I think the goal is reclaiming the internet for the good of humanity. We cannot let it be co-opted by these guys and these horrible ideologies because we need it you know Tully's going to talk in a minute about how, how the internet can bring us together and how amazing things can happen for people on the internet and that's what it was designed for I heard Vince Cerf's talk at the ANU recently he's the father of the internet or one of them and he said he created the internet so we could all have a voice for the good of humanity okay and I want you to keep that front of your mind in this fight Okay, thank you very much.